So I suppose I'm quite keen to see um, this March will be the first time ever that the government's results over food insecurity measurement will be out. Mm -hmm. And that's come off the back of a private members bill that I introduced to Parliament prior to that. Hunger and food insecurity wasn't measured in the UK. We're one of the few Western countries that didn't do that. So I'm looking forward to seeing the results of that. But more importantly, once we've got those results, we can then look, you know, it takes the political football out of, you know, is poverty happening or not? Yeah. Because often in the Chamber and the House of Commons, there's arguments back and forwards, you know, oh, there's not that many people poor, there's not that many people going hungry. Well, these figures and these stats from the implementation of my bill will show exactly where the hotspots are and it will prove that there are people going without that we already know of but there'll be pockets of people that we don't know of either and it'll be a way of drilling down and getting into those communities and finding out what's going on and trying to help out. There's also um, I'm currently trying to push through my school breakfast bill because there's um, there's about 2 million kids turn up to school every day, still hungry. Um, the school breakfast provision that the government have put in expires this year. There's no funding in place for it to continue. However, there is money in the soft drinks industrial levy that could make it continue. And it could hit every single school where they are disadvantaged children, because at the minute, I think it only hits under 10% of the schools that it should. Mm -hmm. So I've got a meeting with the minister soon, I'm gathering lots of support for that. And I'm hoping that that bill will be implemented so that no child turns up too hungry to school to learn. Yeah. And there's also, you know, we're coming up to the summer again, where there's holiday activity and food um, groups happening right across the country. That came off the back of another bill that I helped sponsor, which ensured that the government give money. But again, you know, none of this, none of this is tackling the root causes of poverty or the root causes of hunger. It's all stick and plaster stuff. And really until the government start implementing policies and making sure people have enough to live on, then we're always gonna be just putting a stick and plaster over a problem that's gonna get worse and worse, especially in the middle of the pandemic. I wonder though, do you feel as an active Christian, do you feel that your personal beliefs influence your politics at all? I mean, this is always a tricky one. And, and for me, you know, um, I'm, I'm a Catholic and Catholicism has its roots in social justice. It always has. Um, and, you know, I was a Catholic long before I was a Labour Party member. So obviously there's going to be some some links there. And I am going to approach my work as an MP with those those teachings and that ethos behind us. It's something that's never going to leave us. But I always make sure that, you know, as an as an MP and as a politician, you've got to not push your faith down people's throats so to speak because some people don't like that so but it is it's it's a core it's who it's who I am um I grew up with those teachings I grew up with those values of you know if there's someone in need do everything you can to help them even if you haven't got much yourself you know I grew up in a community where everyone helped each other out and you know I'd go to church every Sunday with and it was a place where people come together and, and helped each other. And, and that kind of thing is just, it's rooted through my DNA. It's who I am and it will never leave us. And I think it does transfer into my work in Parliament as well, because the one thing that I've pushed for in the seven years I've been there is action on poverty. And that definitely comes from my faith and from my early experiences in the church. What do you think will be key in the next year to address the needs of those that are unfortunately likely to find themselves in poverty? I mean, I think, you know, I've always been really clear that poverty isn't inevitable and it is a direct result of policies from central government. We're in the middle of a pandemic. This isn't going to go away, this pandemic, anytime soon, despite what we keep hearing. And more and more people are going to be slipping into poverty through no fault of their own. So we need to have a situation where the state gives everybody enough to live on where people have enough money to survive so that they're not having to rely on charity, they're not having to rely on faith groups, and they're not having to rely on their neighbours, because that is never a substitute for proper state support. Yes. And eventually that will run out. We've seen it ourselves in, in our local food banks, you know, shelves have been bare from time to time. So there needs to be a situation where literally, you know, we are still a rich country, despite everything that's happening, despite our economy tanking at the minute, we are still one of the wealthiest countries in the world. There is enough there. It's about having the political will to to make sure that those who are going without don't go without.